So hi, I'm Kyle McDonald. I'm a strategic advisor to Iron.io. Uh, we're one of the companies focused uh, very heavily on the serverless sort of architecture space as it's been evolving. Um, and I'm here to walk you through a little bit about what that looks like. Um, just a few things about me. So I'm an advisor at Iron.io, uh, focused mainly on our strategy and kind of emerging technology space. Uh, prior to this, I led strategy at Mirantis uh, and also ran the cloud and server business at Canonical and had various other fun jobs before that. Um, and spent some time at the OpenStack Foundation uh, kind of in the early days. So I've seen lots of things. It's been fun. Um, a little bit about Iron.io. For those of you who don't know, uh, Iron.io is focused around multi-cloud management and really bringing things like uh, serverless and some of the upper level API services you find at uh, places like Amazon uh, into an environment that you can take with you and sort of use at any cloud provider you go to. And so that's a lot of what the company's focused on. Uh, there are 50. Uh, we're based in San Francisco. It says we're based here, but uh, we're not. Uh, we do have a bunch of employees in Austin, though, so uh, if you're looking for work and want to come work in OpenStack or are interested in serverless, please hit us up. Um, and we've got 500 customers and do millions of containers a day, uh, and I think that number is actually in almost tens of millions now. Um, so when we talk about what is serverless computing, this has become a buzzword that's kind of been thrown around the industry. Everybody's using it. Um, interesting to note, uh, Iron actually published a white paper on this in 2012, so it's uh, not necessarily something new to us. Um, but we think it's interesting because now, as the sort of discussions have happened and as we've started to see some of the first implementations, we're now looking at a completely different way of developing software. And especially as that becomes more prevalent in the cloud and as it becomes more prevalent in multiple clouds, that's becoming more and more obvious. Um, most of that is not actually coming from anything it's coming mostly from this abstraction layer that we previously had all been building development models on, um, becoming a different sort of abstraction layer. And I'll talk about that in a little bit here. Um, this is obviously giving you all of the motherhood and corporate apple pie stuff. Uh, we're getting better businesses. Things are moving faster. As developers don't have to think about physical constraints, the, the moral of the story here, just to fast forward to the end, without having developers thinking about physical constraints, and artificial sort of things like how do servers and workloads and the infrastructure elements sort of play together. Uh, if you're a developer and you don't have to think about those and you can spend your time writing great code and trust that the infrastructure will handle those for you, it makes everything work. So that's kind of the premise that we operate under. So this has been a learning evolution for, for us sort of at Iron, but we think this is probably like our learnings from this are probably very similar to the learnings we're observing in developers and sort of developer communities. And the best way to go through that is kind of, so Chad, the CEO of Iron, calls this a, a vision quest. Uh, I'm not cool enough to use that. So I kind of just wanted to walk you through like some of the parallels we've seen just in the way people have learned and sort of the way they've applied things, um, because I think that'll help us understand a little bit about, A, why the topic serverless has gotten a lot of controversy, and B, uh, a different way to understand it that's, that's got a lot less buzzwords and practicality in it and more around concept. So when we think about how people learned, this is probably the place where I'll start first. Um, you know, we all learned, and I'm assuming most of us in this room, there are a few of us who are younger, but um, I learned playing with Legos. Uh, Legos were physical elements that I constructed together to make an airplane. Um, you know, this was, uh, I'm sure, everybody in this room has played with Legos before, right? Please. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna count that. Um, say it again? All right, I will buy you some Legos at the end of this. <laughs> so uh, other ways I learned, math class uh, on my calculator. Uh, you could build games, you could do programming. This was one of the first places I learned how to take abstract concepts, put them into a device, use some constructs, and have it do what I wanted it to do, right? Um, these are all things you've done. Uh, in the early days of gaming, I had to figure out my config.sys and change the memory buffers and make all of the things work. Otherwise, video games just didn't work. And then if you fast forward that and I add in like what the internet implications of this were, um, you know, I spent my childhood getting as many phone lines in my house running as possible. Uh, apparently Chad and all of the other people in Iron did too. We all kind of shared this experience where uh, we learned how to play collective video games and sort of like had online communities. And we were doing a lot of this through bulletin board systems, right? So come back to this is how we've evolved our learning, right? Physical things, 
come together, you add communication elements, but they're all sort of tangented into this physical, right? We still got together in a room to get our computers together when we needed more bandwidth and when we needed to do something. Fast forwarding a little bit further, we get our entertainment now, like as most of us, from we learned that we got it from Walkmans, iPhones, that sort of thing. We learned that the way to go get information was actually to look it up in an encyclopedia. Uh, I think these things, as we go through this, this gets easier. So all of these were deep physical world connections, right? They relied on either A, a set of very small people, right? If we looked at kind of the bulletin board example, right? That was a small known quantity of people that you, you were engaging with. It wasn't a large scale internet. And all of these things ended up reverting back to being physical. So whatever the programming I did in my calculator was, it was executing it locally, and it was really just a set of instructions changing like voltage. That's what it was. This is very 180 degrees different to the learning we're seeing sort of happening today in, in like the younger people. It's gonna be great to say that for a few minutes. Right, they played Minecraft. They learned to come together online, completely virtually, instantiate a world made up of physical elements, but it's all virtual to them. It's completely a virtual experience. They turn things off and go away and play football and don't worry that any of this existed, right? This is another game. Uh, it's on uh, the Androids, and this is awesome. If you look at this, so this is what kids are playing with today, right? And you can like make dance moves, and you can have characters, all kinds of cool things. That's cool. But not as cool as some of the other little things. And I'm going to point them out to you because I didn't actually get the slide that had them in here. But um, does anybody have a guess at what this looks like? Can anybody guess what computing tool most of us use on a daily basis that has some of the same visual design elements here? All right. Clearly lunch. Uh, so this is, take a look at this and see if you see any GitHub in here, right? Uh, essentially at the bottom, there is in remixes, this is very similar concept to forking in GitHub, right? The ability to take somebody's already created dance set of characters and outfits and then do something extra and different with them. Uh, Tell me that doesn't sound familiar to you, right? Uh, also, notice you can star. So you can start to rate and rank what you've seen out of people. And then you can start to share it up at the top. So these are a couple of elements. This is how kids are learning and experiencing their world today. Interesting that they're seeing some of the same design cues from GitHub. I would argue that some of GitHub's design cues are finding their way back into other things, but that's a different story. Um, augmented reality, right? Any kid who's got Snapchat can show you exactly how to put bunny ears if you don't already know. It's awesome. Um, and then World of Warcraft. This was how you experienced uh, sort of connecting and engaging with other people. These were role-playing games. You know, these were all, once again, uh, what we used to see as deeply physical connections when we come into a room. These are all completely virtual experiences now. And then finally, obviously, I had to throw in the Pokemon Go slide because, you yeah, know, there's Pokemon Gym around here. Um, and then finally, the last thing is about learning, right? And this is how you take a practical application and execute it Right, you know, think about your time as a developer here. How do you take a set of things and do something with them? Um, we learned how to bow, like I learned how to tie a tie on YouTube. Um, I can admit that out loud now. Uh, apparently there's 1.75 million ways, 74 million ways to tie a tie, or at least places that will tell you how to tie a tie. So vast amounts of information. It's not actually getting the information, it's what you do with it. And finally, Apple TV. I'm going a little bit faster here because we got a little bit of a late start. Um, so these are all the ways new consumers, new developers are learning to engage their world, right? They're not seeing any of the physical elements. They're not understanding a lot of the physical constraints that are underneath. And frankly, for a lot of the developers that are sort of engaging and coming out now, they've never had to do a lot of that work, right? Servers and clouds just existed. And you didn't learn that they were actually made up of actual physical servers. You just saw them as addresses for where your VM was and had a login credential. And it was all kind of magic how it happened, right? So that was the first kind of evolution. And when we talk about this evolution, we can kind of chart it on a path, right? We can look at how we went from the early mainframe monolithic days to client server and how that had a completely different interaction creating open systems. We can look at how the broadband web started to drive development of end tier applications. This is all kind of like higher level stuff. But if you think about this, it's all been an evolving trend. But one of the things that's interesting is as you get to this virtualization and cloud era, 
we've started to decouple hardware and software. And this was kind of, virtualization was one of the first places this happened, cloud's the second place. But this is decoupling the hardware from the software, and the software now being driven by hardware, right? And then microservices, if you sort of look at these, and I'll tie these together in a second. Microservices, what are they? Well, if we looked at old school monolithic Java applications, these are really, take that app, take that monolithic thing, deconstruct it into smallest possible units of execution. Those are essentially what microservices are. Uh, you can put it in different ways. They're awesome because you can start to take those services and scale them in very different ways, but they're a new architecture. They're a new way of thinking about it and different than it was before. Moving forward, a lot of that microservices implementation has now come to being, you know, it's like, where do we execute that? Well, that's a, that's a container-centric world. And containers are interesting because they represent, A, it's a great physical construct for us to be able to talk about now, uh, but like, it's worth remembering how containers happen and why containers were important. Containers were important in the old days of shipping. Uh, so there was an established container size. It enabled train and shipping and ground shipping all to work seamlessly because the unit could be moved around. Everybody had systems that knew how they worked. And suddenly, instead of thinking, there was one extra detail here, I missed it. But one of the things that people don't know about the shipping industry is that prior to like 1920, you didn't actually think of units in the shipment. You only saw shipments as the entire unit. And so a company, like if you look at kind of some of the transactions, like how the business side of this happened, a company would actually buy all of the cargo and then would actually on your behalf sell all of that cargo when it was going to a further, like another country location. And so you actually had boats as acting as delivery middlemen, right? And one of the reasons why they had to do that was because these systems weren't standardized. The standardizing of these systems enabled people to move the middleman out who was frankly controlling a lot of the commerce and a lot of the value. Minor nuance there. So as we do this, and we've seen this evolution happen where we've taken microservices, we've implemented container architectures, this new thing has come up called serverless. And it's a buzzword, it's got some buzzword things attached to it, but, but think of it this way. Serverless is an architecture that enables you to decouple as a developer the code you're writing and the executions and the microservices you're creating from the physical world that's going to be executing and delivering those. And they have a couple of characteristics that you can sort of attach to this. The first one is that as a developer, you just write your code. You don't actually know how it's being executed. Your application is made up of functions, uh, typically many of them and small, right? So minimum level of execution to sort of be isolated. And then that compute is on demand. It's triggered by events. It's not you as a developer deciding what the flow of events is going to be and instantiating all the things around them. Now this is different than a traditional architecture, right? So if we look, that took six mouse clicks, but this is, you know, in a traditional architecture, kind of the way we were doing things in the past, even in a fast forwarded version, we'd be getting the cub from GitHub. We'd be looking at it, we'd be making our modifications and forking it, we'd be putting it back, we'd do a lot of work, we'd eventually be handing it to an ops team to go deploy, they would be putting it on servers, this became a process, right? Even in the fast forwarded cloud world where we were actually able to compress the timeline of development, we still had a very long timeline in getting those things that were developed into production and operating. Um, and months mean money. In a serverless architecture, we look at things a little bit differently. Ah, okay, so in a serverless architecture, you're either taking a set of existing functions or functions you've built, you're leveraging a cloud provider or a cloud you've already got, and then you're assembling and instantiating these functions and giving them a set of events to be triggered on, right? That is really all we have today in serverless. And like there's more that you can think about, but like that's as a concept, think of it that way. Um, here's the business slide. 50% of computing workloads will go serverless uh, according to a lot of enterprises. The pickup in Amazon Lambda has been tremendous. When we look at it, that's kind of the first major implementation of serverless coming around, right? Um, if you ask any developer today if they've looked at Lambda, it's a really interesting trend to sort of see, um, like if you start to ask developers, you know, have you played with Lambda? What are you doing with it? You start to see a very interesting skew of kind of the people who are working with Lambda and what they're doing with it. Um, and I would argue that that skew uh, comes a lot from a lot of the mobile app developers and sort of there's a whole set of segments that we previously have not engaged with, but that are becoming more infrastructure-centric as we go. Um, 
other players that are entering the space. Microsoft has come in with Azure Functions. Uh, Google is there as well. And we're fully expecting kind of more players to play in this space. Now, what's interesting about that, and this is kind of the, the wrap up here, but then I'm happy to take questions and do technical afterwards. Um, it was easy to look at cloud and move, cloud, move workloads into cloud because it was lift and shift from your existing virtualized operations, right? This is what we just got done doing for the last 10 years. The higher stack services, things inside of the cloud providers like Lambda, have heavy lock-in, right? These are functions, you know, if you use Lambda or you're using Google or you're using Azure, and not that any of these things aren't awesome, but they all have a lock-in cost associated with them. That's, that's how a service provider is getting you to use their cloud. And it's great um, that they have those things, but it's unfortunate if you want to start looking at how you take your application to other places or how you develop applications that maybe can't be going to public cloud. There are still a lot of them. And so given that you're locked into any one of these APIs if you develop currently, um, that's kind of a problem. Uh, and then finally, I'll go through, you know, if we look at sort of how this happened, uh, kind of to trace back and kind of close on my earlier comments. We looked at the atomic unit of compute changing very rapidly. Uh, we originally started looking at servers, we've moved to VMs, we're moving to containers, and we're now moving to functions, right, as an element of serverless computing. We looked at hardware as being a physical machine, a box in a data center, provided by something like co-location, eventually abstracted by something by cloud, and now we're abstracting one level further by saying, we just need to have your code. We'll figure out all the execution for you and the back end. And the architecture has gone from you know, uh, monolithic on a server, metal ar architectures, uh, kind of distributed architectures, cloud architectures, and now we're in the microservices and serverless world, right? And so as, we, as we've dissected all three of these as kind of architectures, that's how we've ended up in serverless. Um, so to close, uh, the future of serverless looks something like this. Uh, we expect that a lot of the companies who are doing development will start to see themselves less as just developers inside of a company and more like software providers inside of a company. And this, will come, this comes from the fact that as you're making functions and as you're sort of uh, deploying a lot of the methodology used in serverless computing, the, the artifacts of creation from that will really be code that other people can take to use, other people can exploit, and other developers inside your company can eventually build triggers and events to sort of create. Um, that's a very different model than it is today. Today you're sharing code, you're explaining how it works, you're figuring out interfaces to it. When you have the ability to just say, create an event and have it access and do something with my function, that's a very different model. Um, we think that the internet of things, especially as we talk about event-driven computing, uh, the idea that triggers can actually cause your function to, to begin changes sort of the way we can think about uh, a lot of the Internet of Things use cases. Internet of Things is an interesting area because it's very bursty workloads. Uh, the battery and power dynamics of having a lot of the edge devices mean that they're not always in consistent communication. They're kind of telling you when, they're, when an event has happened or when something needs to happen. Uh, and so the fact that we can actually trigger based on those events a set of compute and a set of activities is sort of a different kind of model, but it fits really well with how mobile and Internet of Things are sort of coming together in terms of architecture. Um, we think there's going to be increasing innovation in this space, uh, mostly because, as I've just mentioned, the leaders currently, uh, outside of companies like Iron, who are delivering this as, as fast as we can to enterprises, are really the public cloud providers. And so there's a, an interesting set that will, of innovation that will come as these cloud providers start to take things like their machine learning assets, their various storage assets, and potentially their data mine assets, and start putting those to work. So we think those are all very interesting sort of possibilities. And then finally, uh, we think that as you're building more public clouds and as you're building more private clouds, we're going to see a lot of people looking for how they can deliver serverless. And more importantly than what we've currently had, how they can deliver serverless in a way that is portable and easy to use for users without a heavy tax and without the benefits being primarily won by service providers who are locking you in. So uh, that's kind of the presentation. Can I answer any questions? So uh, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on uh, the role serverless will play within product and platform. If you see it more being a part of a larger platform, taking on certain kind of roles and responsibilities, or if you see serverless basically 
particular theme and say, okay, that's an entire platform or an entire product and architecture to be built on Twitter. Okay, uh, so the question was, um, let me try and repeat that question. So, uh, do I think we're going to see we're going to see serverless architectures being completely built out, or do we think these are going to be components in an architecture? So, I think uh, currently today we're seeing this as components in an architecture. Um, a good one is like image recognition in S3. There's great demo candy around for that. Um, I think that that eventually moves to being to being much more holistic architectures. I think. Uh, if you look at today, we're in a very immature place with three public cloud providers all having a product out in the last year and having that really be sort of the thing. Um, I think if we fast forward two or three, maybe even five years, adding in a lot of the mobile and IoT sort of requirmental growth that's gonna have, like required growth, like we have to figure out how to do event-driven computing to work with IoT. Um, it just sort of, there's a lot of stuff that doesn't work. So I expect that as we get there, we'll see it in more of a platform aspect. Any other questions? Uh, I mean, yes, that's one. Uh, there's a lot of like inventory checking applications that can be done with it. Um, so I saw one the other day at a very large retailer where they actually have sort of an event-driven approach that uh, for a number of flagged items in their e-commerce store, they had a function that would actually go and compare it against three other stores uh, that began the process of should they do a revision in price. And so that was an interesting sort of like when somebody buys a Coleman grill, we know that that's a good marker for what a fluctuating price level would look like at these three other e-commerce retailers. So that's like the logic to go and scrape from their screens what their price is and do a comparison was only kicked off after a certain X amount of orders. Like there's, so there's examples like that. Uh, it's a combination of iron worker uh, and then iron fabric and iron MQ. Any other questions? Cool. Uh, so I'm sorry we went through that a little bit quicker than. Oh, yep. How do we get access to iron fabric? Because I have iron MQ and iron worker and iron cast, and my UI, but I don't see anything related to iron fabric. Uh, you should talk to me afterwards. Okay. Awesome <laughs> things are coming. We are right now building a full uh, application with a serverless architecture. Okay, then I definitely would like to get your name and number. Awesome. Well, cool. Thank you very much. And glad we have a customer here. That's awesome. Thank you.